Good morning and welcome to Black Hat. Uh, this is the second talk of the day. This is the reverse engineering track and we have Charlie Miller and Noah Johnson here to talk to you about a new project they're working on. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Charlie. This is Noah. Uh, thanks for coming everybody and everyone at home. Hi. Uh, so today we're going to talk about crash analysis with BitBlaze. Okay, so um, what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, so first, uh, we're going to go back to, to you know why why is this talk important? So why do I care? And uh, it has to go has to do with fuzzing and um, and the fact that people are starting to realize the hard part about fuzzing isn't actually finding bugs, but but actually knowing what to do with all the crashes you find. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, BitBlaze itself and what it does and, and how you can use it to help solve this problem. And then we'll move on to a bunch of uh, real life case studies. So. First, I'll look at Adobe Reader and uh, look at how, in general, this, these techniques can be used uh, with, with crashes from there. And then we'll look at four actual bugs uh, that were found with fuzzing and how you would use that for, uh, for um, use BitBlaze to, to analyze those crashes and figure out if they're exploitable, how, you know, what the, the underlying bug is, and that sort of thing. And then finally, we'll, we'll try to wrap things up. Okay, so 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 how did I get involved in this? Uh, and and I should point out, so so you probably know me. I work in industry and and I'm a consultant and all that stuff. Noah and and the rest of the BitBlaze team are actually at Berkeley, so it's sort of a, an academic and industrial collaboration. So it's sort of you don't see that too much. And, and so the question is, how that how that get started? So about this time last year, and a lot of researchers go through this uh, after Black Hat. You know, you, you you've given your talk, and then you're like, okay, now what am I going to do? Right, so I started thinking about like, well, what kind of research do I want to do? You know, this is like last August, and uh, you know, I, I, I typically my my sort of interests are about finding bugs and that sort of thing, and I'm always kind of thinking about putting to own, you know, the, next, the, the you know next March. So uh, I was like, well, what's some some things I can use to find bugs that you know is something I haven't done before? And so the the basically the only guy I know from from academia is David Molnar, who now works at, at Microsoft Research, but at the time I thought worked actually was was still a, a, in academia somewhere. Anyway, so I called him up and I was like, okay, David, I, I, need, I need you to hook me up with someone who, who's writing tools in academia that, that find bugs. And these tools have to work on, on you know, real binaries. You can't have any sort of restrictions like they have to be small or they have to be written in Lisp or you know, whatever crazy things academics come up with these days. Um, and then it has to work on real binaries. It has to, and I, I, I don't have source code. I don't have symbols. I don't have anything like that. And I, and I want to be able to find bugs in, in these real programs. And so he's like, well, you know, it's kind of tough. Uh, he, he gave me the names of a couple people, uh, one of which was Don Song at, uh, at Berkeley, who's, who's here today. Um, so uh, I started talking to her about, like, you know, hey, I want a you know, program that finds bugs. And, and she told me that, well, they kind of have something that does that, but she explained what BitBlaze was. And I realized that uh, really it solves a, a different problem than I wanted to solve. So it's not about finding bugs, it's about analyzing crashes. Um, so they actually have something that, that would be really good at that. And so I was like, well, that would be interesting. Let, let's see that. So that's, that's how. I got interested in this, and uh, let's move on to, to more discussion about why this is a problem and what the problem is. So uh, until maybe uh, a year ago, this wasn't a problem for me because the way that, that I looked for bugs was I would turn on my fuzzer, it would run for a while, and eventually it would find a bug, and I would turn it off, and I would you know exploit that bug and give a talk or whatever, right? So uh, I, I didn't really have a problem with finding too many bugs because I, I only wanted to find one. But this year, uh, in preparation for Cancer Quest, I wanted to find lots of bugs. And then I, I saw this problem. And, and the first person that I know who, who really talked about this problem was Ben Nagy, who gave a talk uh, you know, about an hour ago. <laughs> so, uh, so he's really the king of, of large scale fuzzing out in the research world. Uh, you know, I'm sure Microsoft does, does it as well, of course. So um, in 2009 at Syscan, I met him. And he was giving a talk about some fuzzing he did on Microsoft Word. So uh, you know, dot doc files, and uh, so here's some statistics. So he found 200,000 crashes, and uh, they were sorted into 61 bins. So 61 some somewhat unique crashes, and uh, basically, you know, it was him and maybe a couple guys, and that was just too many crashes to analyze by hand. He couldn't do it. Uh, so it, it turned out of those 61, four of them were serious security vulnerabilities, and and the rest weren't. Um, and, and the problem was trying to figure out which of the you know which of these were exploitable, and of the four, like what were what was the actual bug? And, and so just to show that like he couldn't do this himself, he had to actually give these to Microsoft. And I know Ben, and he, that must have really you know hurt him to have to do that. So uh, 
he, he gave it to Microsoft and they, they helped triage them. And, and the point is it was, it was too much resources needed to, to analyze all the crashes. Okay. So, um, so then I, I, I had this problem as well. So uh, part of, I gave this talk at Cantec West and in, in some ways this talk is sort of the continuation of that talk. So at, at that talk I, I, uh, I, I talked about all the fuzzing runs I did and I found you know, a ton of bugs and, and I, there were way too many I couldn't analyze them all. So uh, for example in preview I found 1300 different crashes of which uh, Crash Wrangler says uh, there was, there's really 220 unique ones of which 60 are exploitable. So there's just no way that I can look at 60 bugs and 60 crashes and try to figure out what the bugs are and if they're really exploitable. This is too much for me to do. Likewise in Adobe Reader there were 30 to 40 crashes that I found and 70 in open office. So it's like, you know, this is a serious problem and, and there's actually a lot of talks at Black Hat to this year talking about this. So, you know, I'm not the only researcher who, who's noticed this. Right, so um, more just about this. So, so uh, the hard part now I think, uh, which is sort of sad, right? It should be hard to find bugs but it actually isn't. So the hard part isn't finding the bug, it's, it's, it's sort of prioritizing which of the crashes to look at, um, figuring out which of the ones are exploitable. For the ones that are exploitable, figuring out what the underlying bug is so you can either fix it or exploit it depending on who you are. Um, and then uh, the other thing is while fuzzing, eventually you can get it so automated that you can just turn it on, walk out of the room and come back in a month and, and there's a bunch of crashes. Uh, trying to figure out how to, you know, what the underlying bugs is. You can't really automate that. You can just make it easier. And so that's sort of the point of this talk is uh, tools to, figure, to, to reduce the time from crash to knowing what the bug is or, you know, even further writing the exploit. All right. So now I'm going to pass it on to Noah to, to tell you guys about BitBlaze. Okay, so I'm Noah. I work with uh, Professor Don Song at Berkeley, and of course, we've been collaborating with Charlie over the last few months. Uh, so, BitBlaze is this binary analysis infrastructure that allows us to effectively analyze binary code. So, in this talk, I'll give sort of a high level overview of the two main research focuses of the BitBlaze project. Uh, and the first is to be able to build a sort of a unified framework uh, that allows us to very effectively analyze binary code uh, and sort of addresses the common needs of security applications while also being easily extendable. Um, and then once we have this platform, the second research focus is to be able to use the platform to enable a wide variety of new security applications. So this picture sort of visualizes what I just talked about. We want a unified platform that we can use to solve a whole bunch of different types of problems. Right? So let's look at why this is hard first. Of course, in security applications, we can't avoid having to deal directly with binary code. Oftentimes we want to analyze commercial software that we don't have the source code for or malicious code and attackers don't usually release the source code along with their attack, right? So we need to deal directly with binary code and unfortunately binary code can be very hard to deal with sometimes as everyone here probably already knows, right? So first of all, binary code is extremely complex and our analysis system needs to be able to model this complexity accurately if we want the analysis to be correct. So the size of and complexity of modern architecture instruction sets make this modeling very challenging. Uh, another challenge is that binary, of course, is different from source code in that it lacks higher level semantic information. So as a specific example, the, uh, the function abstraction doesn't really exist at all at the binary level. I mean, we can have call instructions, but I could call any arbitrary address, right? That doesn't tell me anything about where function boundaries are. Uh, and so we need to be able to deal with this. Also, lots of times we want to be able to analyze operations within the kernel and interactions between multiple processes. So this requires a whole system view which poses greater challenges than in just traditional single program analysis. And finally, we need to remember we're trying to analyze malicious code sometimes and code doesn't always want to be analyzed. So uh, malware commonly employs anti-analysis techniques like code packing, encryption, or self-modifying or dynamically generated code. So based on these challenges, we have a couple sort of high level design goals which motivate the architecture of the BitBlaze platform. The first is that we want the platform to be able to enable to accurately model the behavior of programs, okay? So we build precise formal models and then allow tools to sort of accurately reason about the program execution behavior symbolically. We also want to build a core set of utilities that sort of address the common needs of security problems but is, can be reused or maybe target different architectures and easily extended. 
Uh, and finally, of course, both static and dynamic analysis have their own strengths and weaknesses. So static analysis is more complete in that we can explore multiple paths, uh, but it's limited by things like uh, indirection and pointer aliasing and a general lack of higher level abstractions. So dynamic analysis is, in, is not limited in these same ways, but we can only analyze a single path at a time. So ideally we'd like to be able to combine both static and dynamic analysis to sort of leverage the relative strengths of both wherever possible. So before I talk about the actual implementation of our system, I want to sort of whet your appetite with some of the cool applications that BitBlaze has enabled. Uh, and there's a whole bunch and I don't have time to talk about all these, but you can refer to the white paper uh, or the website for more information. But the first one I want to talk about is uh, vulnerability detection and analysis. So this is the most recent work and of course the bad guys are constantly looking for bugs in uh, benign programs, right? But what about trying to find bugs in malicious code, right? So we're sort of turning the tables, right, and forcing the bad guys to have to write secure code. So using a modified version of uh, sim using a modified version of our symbolic execution tool, we can sort of explore the execution space of a malware sample in ways we couldn't do before, because typically malware employs things like uh, checksums and decryption routines, which are sort of hard to reason about. So once we've done this sort of symbolic execution and we have these constraints we split them up and solve just a little piece of them and then use that to rebuild an input that exploits the program. So we've actually found vulnerabilities in, uh, in six different classes of malware samples which could conceivably be exploited by an attacker over the network. So for example, you could take over uh, a botnet or disable a Trojan horse. Of course, this raises uh, ethical considerations which we won't get into here. But. The next thing I want to talk about is model extraction. So we have a, a static analysis component which allows us to extract models of programs. So suppose we fed this tool uh, a web browser, right, Internet Explorer, and then we extract a model for the function that determines the content type of any given object, right? Once we have this then we can directly construct an input that causes the web browser to incorrectly infer the type for. And of course this enables a uh, uh, content sniffing cross site scripting attacks and we showed that Internet Explorer 7 is vulnerable to such an attack. Um, another application is protocol reverse engineering. So in security applications oftentimes we want to understand network protocols or file formats and traditionally this is a manual process and is very time consuming, right? But we have this dynamic analysis component of BitBlaze which allows us to analyze program behavior. So if we give this tool a program that implements a given protocol, then we can watch exactly how it processes messages in that protocol. And how it processes and parses these messages and constructs its own messages gives us a wealth of information about the structure of the messages as well as the semantics. So using that we can then semi-automatically rebuild the protocol without access to the source code. So hopefully this sort of lets you realize how powerful this approach is. So next I want to talk about how we actually enable these kinds of applications. So BitBlaze is split up into three core components. The first component is a static analysis component called Vine and Vine lets us do static analysis and symbolic execution and it also provides a set of sort of core utilities for common types of analysis. The dynamic analysis component lets us run a program in an emulated environment and perform very fine grained uh, binary instrumentation and also extract semantic information from uh, the operating system as well as the program and perform dynamic taint analysis. And finally, we have the symbolic execution components. Currently there are three of them, Rudder, Bitfuzz and Fuzzball and these components use the functionalities which are provided by Vine and Temu to enable uh, symbolic exploration. So for a given program execution path, these tools can generate the symbolic predicates that the inputs have to satisfy to follow that path. Right. So in this particular application, the symbolic exploration doesn't play a large role. So I won't describe the implementation of these components, uh, but they play a key role in a lot of our other applications. And again, you can look at the website for more information. So the first thing I'll talk about is this static analysis component which we call Vine. This is sort of a high level overview of Vine and Vine is split up into a platform specific front end and a platform independent back end. And then at the core of Vine is this intermediate language which we've developed to be small but also flexible in that it can 
accurately represent the different types of assembly languages that our tools use. So then in this architecture, instructions from a binary program are translated to the intermediate language by the front end, and then all back-end analyses are done on this intermediate language. So this is convenient and, and allows very